For lecture 12, we'll look more at Lewis structures and add the ideas of formal charge or oxidation state. Lewis structures are key to understanding organic chemistry. Here is a disaccharide that you likely have in your system known as glucose. Here is one of the DNA bases. Here are some amino acids that are part of your protein. Here is the heme structure in hemoglobin in your red blood cells. So you're full of organic molecules. So if you're not sure how to answer these questions, you might want to go back and look at the previous lecture on Lewis structures. I am going to remind you that when you calculate your valence electrons, do not forget to include the charge. It would be valence electrons minus the charge. Hopefully that makes sense because this structure has an additional electron with it. It has a minus one charge, so we should include that in the valence electrons. Now I would like you to draw the structure on a piece of paper and determine which one of these letters matches the structure that you've drawn. Don't forget to follow the octet rule. Now we need to add to our Lewis structures with the idea of formal charges and oxidation numbers. Formal charges and oxidation numbers are both determined by the same formula, which is group number minus possession number. Formal charge divides the bonding electrons up equally by considering the bonds to be purely covalent. Oxidation number gives the bonding electrons to the more electronegative atom, so the bonds are considered to be ionic. Here's an example using the sulfite ion. There are four atoms in the structure, so electrons required is 4 times 8, or 32 electrons. The valence electrons will be 6 for sulfur, 6 for each oxygen, and don't forget, this has a minus 2 charge. So minus a minus 2 gives us 2 additional valence electrons for a total of 26 valence electrons. When we subtract 26 from 32, we wind up with 6 electrons used in 3 bonds. 26 minus 6 gives us 20 electrons, which when divided by 2, gives us 10 lone pairs. So sulfur will go in the middle with the oxygens around the sides. There are our 3 bonds. Oxygen has 1 bond so it needs six additional electrons around each oxygen. So each oxygen has access to an octet of electrons. Sulfur has three bonds, so we will need two more electrons to give sulfur access to eight electrons. Now it's time to add formal charge to each atom in the molecule. We'll start with the oxygens. Oxygen is in group six on the periodic table. Now I'm going to draw a circle around the oxygen and split the bond precisely in half so that one electron goes to oxygen and one electron goes to sulfur. Looking within that circle, oxygen formally has access to seven electrons. So group number six minus seven will give us a minus one formal charge on each of the oxygen atoms. So here is the difference in the circles. The octet circle considers all of the bond and oxygen has access to an octet, but the formal charge only considers half the bond as formally belonging to oxygen. So seven electrons formally belong to oxygen. So if oxygen is used to six valence electrons, and it has seven, 
that it must feel like it has a minus one charge. Now about sulfur. Sulfur is in group six. If we split the bonds equally, sulfur formally has access to five electrons. So sulfur is used to six electrons, but it has five in the valence. So it has a plus one formal charge. One other thing about the formal charge. The sum of the formal charge must equal the charge of the compound. So minus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, all adds up to minus two, which is the charge on the sulfite ion. Oxidation number is counted differently. In oxidation number, the more electronegative atom gets both bonding electrons. So the group number of oxygen is the same. That has not changed. It is group six. Which atom is more electronegative, oxygen or sulfur? Well, I hope you answered oxygen. So when we draw our circle of ownership according to oxidation number, these two bonding electrons belong to oxygen. So there are eight electrons in this circle. So a six minus eight gives us an oxidation state of minus two for the oxygen. Does that not sort of agree with the oxidation state rules from chapter four? Rule five says that oxygen within a compound is typically a minus two oxidation state. So the other two oxygens will be exactly the same at minus two. For the sulfur, it's in group six. Oxygen has taken the electrons away from it. So sulfur only has its two bonding electrons according to oxidation state. Six minus two gives us a plus four oxidation state for that sulfur. That is the same answer you would get if you were given the sulfite ion and asked to get the oxidation state of sulfur in that compound. Just like formal charge, the sum of the oxidation numbers must equal the charge of the compound. So minus two, minus two, minus two, plus four, adds up to minus two, which is the charge on the sulfite ion. So what do formal charges and oxidation numbers tell us about the molecule? Well, in general, they tell us that oxygen is a bit negative in this molecule, regardless of whether you look at formal charge or oxidation number. It also tells us sulfur is likely to be somewhat positive in this molecule, either calculational method. So oxygen's charge in the molecule is somewhere between minus one and minus two, and sulfur's charge is somewhere between plus one and plus four. For your homework and for most other organic compounds that you'll encounter in the future, formal charges are used. So unless you encounter a question that specifically asks about oxidation state, please answer with formal charge. So let's go back to this ion that we originally drew and add the formal charges. Now let's practice with the bromate ion. Once again, do not forget to add the charge to your valence electrons. And how about drawing the ion now and adding your formal charge? Which structure is correct? Just for fun, let's try one where you give the oxidation numbers instead of formal charge. So here is the deep thinker question. You're going to need a little bit of advice with this one. You're asked, determine the average oxidation state of carbon using the oxidation state rules and the individual oxidation states of the carbon using the structure. First, let's start with the formula and the average oxidation state. So this is C2H3FO2. All right, let's get set up here. 
first atom plus second atom plus third atom plus fourth atom equal zero. Now let's take a quick check on the oxidation state rules. We're looking at carbon, hydrogen, fluorine, and oxygen. So I think we can come up with fluorine at minus one, oxygen at minus two, and hydrogen when bonded to nonmetals is plus one. Hydrogen, each one is plus one, fluorine minus one, oxygen minus two. All right, there are three hydrogens, so that's plus three. There is one fluorine, so minus one. There are two oxygens, so minus four. So first off, find out what's in the blank. And as you multiplied by three going this way, don't forget to divide by two going this way. So whatever this answer is will give you the carbon average oxidation state. Now, as far as individual oxidation states, that can differ depending on where they are in the compound. So I have added the electrons. Now to draw the circles. I'm not sure which one gets the electrons between hydrogen and carbon. Let me just double check. Oh yes, the question tells us that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So carbon should get the electrons if we're discussing oxidation state. So let's see. In drawing the circle, carbon should get the electrons from hydrogen and from the other hydrogen and split between carbon and fluorine should get the electrons from carbon. So our group number is four. Be sure to subtract the possession number. That will give you the oxidation state of carbon number one. For carbon two, I'll let you figure out who is more electronegative, oxygen or carbon, and draw the circle, and then take group number minus what you decide is the possession number to get oxidation state of carbon two. And finally, if you want to see how consistent this is, you can check your work when you're done. Whatever your value is for carbon average, it should be equal to the values for carbon one plus carbon two divided by two. That's what an average is.